Part 3. What is to be done? Chapter 7. The Crisis of Determinate Negation Back in the 1950s and 1960s, when the Frankfurt School adopted an increasingly critical attitude towards the classical Marxist notion of the historical necessity of revolution, this critique also culminated in their abandonment of the Hegelian notion of determinate negation, the obverse of which is the rise of the notion of the holy other, das ganz andere, as the prospect of the utopian overcoming of the global techno-capitalist order. The idea is that, with the dialectic of enlightenment, which tends towards the zero point of the totally administered society, one can no longer conceptualize breaking out of the deadly spiral of this dialectic by means of the classical Marxist notion according to which the new will emerge from the very contradictions of the present society, through its imminent self-overcoming. The impetus for such an overcoming can only come from an unmediated outside. This abandonment of determinate negation is, of course, the obverse of accepting capitalism's triumph. As we have already noted, the most reliable sign of capitalism's ideological triumph was the virtual disappearance of the very term over the last two or three decades. The contemporary left has reacted in a wide spectrum of modes, which partially overlap, to the full hegemony of global capitalism and its political supplement, liberal democracy. 1. Full acceptance of this framework, continuing to fight for emancipation within its rules. Third way, social democracy. 2. Acceptance of this framework as something that is here to stay, but which one should nonetheless resist, withdrawing from its scope and operating from its interstices. Simon Critchley is an exemplar of this position. 3. Acceptance of the futility of all struggle, since the framework is today all-encompassing, coinciding with its opposite, the logic of concentration camps, the permanent state of emergency. So nothing can really be done. One can only wait for an outburst of divine violence, a revolutionary version of Heidegger's Only God Can Still Save Us, a perspective today embodied by Giorgio Agamben, and, in a way, before him, by the late Adorno. 4. Acceptance of the temporary futility of struggle. In today's triumph of global capitalism, true resistance is not possible, at least not in the metropolis of capitalism. So all we can do till the renewal of the revolutionary spirit in the global working class is to defend what there still is of the welfare state, bombarding those in power with demands we know they cannot fulfill and otherwise withdraw into cultural studies, where one can silently pursue critical work. 5. Emphasis on the fact that the problem is a more fundamental one, that global capitalism is ultimately an ontic effect of the underlying ontological principle of technology or instrumental reason. Heidegger, but in a way, again, also Adorno. 6. Belief that one could undermine global capitalism and state power, however, not by way of directly attacking them, but by refocusing the field of struggle and everyday practices, where one can build a new world. In this way, the foundations of the power of capital and the state will be gradually undermined, and at some point the state will collapse like a cat hovering over the precipice in the cartoons. One thinks here of the Zapatista movement. 7. A postmodern shift of the accent from anti-capitalist struggle to the multiple forms of the politico-ideological struggle for hegemony conceptualized as a contingent process of discursive rearticulation. Ernesto Laclau. 8. A wager that one can repeat at the postmodern level the classical Marxist gesture and enact the determinate negation of capitalism. With today's rise of cognitive work, the contradiction between social production and capitalist relations has reached an unprecedented height, rendering absolute democracy possible for the first time. Art and Negri. One is tempted to categorize these versions as so many modes of the negations of politics proper, which follow the different modes of avoiding a traumatic real in psychoanalysis. Acceptance through denial. Fernandung, a version of whoever that woman in my dream is, it is not my mother. Whatever the new antagonisms are, they are not class struggle.
psychotic foreclosure. Verwerfung, the foreclosed class struggle returns in the real, in the paranoid guise of an invisible and all-powerful enemy, like the Jewish plot. Neurotic repression. Verdrangung, the repressed class struggle returns in the guise of a multiplicity of new antagonisms. And fetishistic disavowal. Verliungdung, the elevation into the principal cause of some fetishistic ersatz of the class struggle as the last thing which we see prior to confronting the class antagonism. We are not dealing here with a series of avoidances of some true radical leftist position. The trauma these avoidances try to blur is rather the lack of such a position. The lesson of the last decades, if there is one, is the indestructibility of capitalism. When already Marx compared it to a vampire, we should bear in mind the living dead aspect of vampires. They always rise up again and again after being stabbed to death. Even the radical Maoist attempt in the Cultural Revolution to wipe out the traces of capitalism ended up with its triumphant return. The Humorous Superego A fear is haunting whatever remains of the contemporary left. The fear of directly confronting state power. Those who still insist on fighting state power, let alone directly taking it over are immediately accused of being stuck in the old paradigm. The task today is to resist state power by withdrawing from its scope, subtracting oneself from it, creating new spaces outside its control. This dogma of the contemporary academic left is best encapsulated by the title of Negri's interview book, Goodbye Mr. Socialism. The idea is that the time of the old left, in its two versions, reformist and revolutionary, which both aimed at taking over state power and protecting the working class's corporate rights, is over. Today, the predominant form of exploitation is the exploitation of knowledge, and so on and so forth. There is a new postmodern social development going on, which the old left refuses to take into account, and in order to renovate itself, the left has to read Deleuze and Negri and start to practice nomadic resistance follow the theory of hegemony, and so on. But what if this very mode of defining the problem is part of the problem? Since the institutionalized left, the third way social democrats, the trade unions and others, so persistently refuses to learn this lesson, the problem must, also, reside with its postmodern critics. Within this postmodern field, Simon Critchley's infinitely demanding is an almost perfect embodiment of the position to which my work is absolutely opposed, and that at two distinct but interconnected levels. That of the account of subjectivity as arising out of ethical commitment to a good, and that of the proposed politics of resistance. When he includes himself among the critical, secular, well-dressed, metrosexual post-Kantians, the irony of this self-characterization occludes its seriousness. No wonder Critchley included in the list of those who resist the clutches of state power, Princess Diana herself. Critchley's starting point is the motivational deficit of our liberal democratic institutions. This deficit sustains two main political attitudes, those of passive and active nihilism. On the one hand, cynical indifference, escape into consumerist hedonism, and so on and on the other, violent fundamentalism, which aims at destroying the corrupt liberal universe. Critchley's problem is how to break out of this deadlock, how to resuscitate emancipatory political passion. This problem is a real one, in our allegedly post-ideological era. After the self-proclaimed end of great emancipatory projects, the gap between meaning and truth seems insurmountable. Who still dares to claim access to a cognitive mapping of our constellation that would simultaneously open up space for a meaningful, radical social transformation. Consequently, today, the very idea of a politics of truth is dismissed as totalitarian. Above and beyond efficient social administration, the main acceptable political goals are negative. To prevent pain and suffering, to establish the minimal conditions for the toleration of different ways of life, to each their own truth. And the task of politics is seen as the art of pragmatic compromise, of the coordination of interests, of guaranteeing the peaceful coexistence of ways of life, as if economic uniformity and cultural diversity 
were the two sides of the same process. However, this liberal democratic prospect remains haunted by the spectre of fundamentalism. Recall the public reaction to the Pope's death. Who would like to live in a state which prohibits abortion and divorce? And yet, the same people who reject the Pope's views admire him for his firm, principled, ethical stance and his message of hope, thereby displaying the need for a firm standard of truth beyond pragmatic relativism. How, then, to break out of this deadlock? Critchley proceeds in two steps. First, in a combination of Levinas, Badiou and Lacan, he deploys the notion of the subject as constituted by its recognition in an unconditional ethical call engendered by the experience of injustice and wrongs. Then he proposes a notion of politics as resistance to state power on behalf of this ethical call. The subject emerges as the reaction to the traumatic encounter of the helpless suffering other, neighbour, which is why it is constitutively dissented, not autonomous but split by the ethical call, a subject defined by the experience of an internalized demand that it can never meet, a demand that exceeds it. The paradox constitutive of the subject is thus the demand that the subject cannot meet, so that the subject is constitutively divided, its autonomy always usurped by the heteronomous experience of the other's demand. Only an omnipotent and infinite God would have been able to meet such a demand. So, Knowing that there is no God, we have to subject ourselves to the demand to be God-like, knowing that we are sure to fail because of our finite condition. Critchley refers here to Levinas's claim that My relation to the other is not some benign benevolence, compassionate care, or respect for the other's autonomy, but is the obsessive experience of a responsibility that persecutes me with its sheer weight. I am the other's hostage. How, then, can the subject attenuate the crushing weight of the superego? How can I respond in infinite responsibility to the other without extinguishing myself as a subject? Critchley turns here to Lacan, to the way Lacan elaborated Freud's notion of sublimation. Aesthetic sublimation enables the subject to achieve a minimum of happiness. The beautiful interposes itself between the subject and the good. It places the subject in relation to the source of the ethical demand but which protects the subject from the direct glare of the thing. Critchley adds humour to the list of sublimations as the benevolent aspect of the superego. In contrast to the evil punishing superego, the severe judge, which crushes us with the weight of infinite guilt on account of our failure to live up to its call, in humour, in which we also observe our finitude and ridiculous failure from the standpoint of the superego, our finitude appears as funny, ridiculous in its failures. Instead of installing anguish and despair, this superego enables us to laugh at our limitations, failures, and false pretensions. What Critchley strangely leaves out of consideration is the brutal, sadistic aspect of humour itself. Humour can be extremely cruel and denigrating. Let us take an extreme example. The infamous Arbeit macht frei over the gates of Auschwitz is no argument against the dignity of work. Work truly makes us free, as Hegel put it in the famous passage of his Phenomenology of Spirit on Master and Servant. What the Nazis did with the motto at the gates of Auschwitz is simply an act of cruel mockery, analogous to raping someone while wearing a t-shirt saying, sex brings pleasure. Critchley's claim that some versions of psychoanalysis, particularly Lacan's, have a problem with the superego, is thus odd. Lacan was fully aware not only of the link between humour and the superego, but also of the brutal sadistic aspect of humour. The Marx Brothers' Duck Soup, their masterpiece, is regarded as a work that makes fun of ridiculous totalitarian state rituals, denouncing their empty posturing, and so on. Laughter is the mightiest weapon. No wonder that totalitarian regimes found it so threatening. This commonplace should be turned upside down. The powerful effect of Duck Soup does not reside in its mockery of the totalitarian state's machinery and paraphernalia but in openly displaying the madness, the fun, the cruel irony, which are already present in the totalitarian state. The Marx Brothers' carnival is the carnival of totalitarianism itself. What is the superego? Recall the strange fact, regularly evoked by Primo Levi and other Holocaust survivors, regarding how their intimate reaction to their survival was marked by a deep split. Consciously, they were fully aware that their survival was just a meaningless accident, 
that they were not in any way responsible for it, that the only guilty perpetrators were their Nazi torturers. At the same time, they were, more than mildly, haunted by the irrational feeling of guilt, as if they had survived at the expense of others who had died, and were thus somehow responsible for their deaths. As is well known, this unbearable feeling of guilt drove many of the survivors to suicide. This feeling of guilt displays the agency of the superego at its purest, the obscene agency which manipulates us into a spiralling movement of self-destruction. What this means is that the function of the superego is precisely to obfuscate the cause of the terror constitutive of our being human, the inhuman core of being human, the dimension of what the German idealists called negativity and what Freud called the death drive. Far from being the traumatic hard core of the real from which sublimations protect us, the superego is itself the mask screening the real. The humorous superego is the cruel and insatiable agency which bombards me with impossible demands and which mocks my failed attempts to meet them, the agency in the eyes of which I am all the more guilty, the more I try to suppress my sinful strivings and meet its demands. As I have noted, the cynical Stalinist motto about the accused at the show trials who profess their innocence, the more they are innocent, the more they deserve to be shot, is the superego at its purest. Consequently, for Lacan, the superego has nothing to do with moral conscience as far as its most obligatory demands are concerned. The superego is, on the contrary, the anti-ethical agency, the stigmatization of our ethical betrayal. As such, the superego is, at its most elementary, not a prohibitive but a productive agency. Nothing forces anyone to enjoy except the superego. The superego is the imperative of jouissance, enjoy. Although jouissance can be translated as enjoyment, translators of Lacan often leave it in French in order to render palpable its successive, properly traumatic character. We are not dealing with simple pleasures, but with a violent intrusion that brings more pain than pleasure. No wonder, then, that Lacan posited an equation between jouissance and the superego. To enjoy is not a matter of following one's spontaneous tendencies. It is rather something we do as a kind of weird and twisted ethical duty. When, following Badieu, Critchley defines the subject as something that emerges through fidelity to the good, a subject is the name for the way in which a self binds itself to some conception of the good and shapes its subjectivity in relation to that good. From a strict Lacanian perspective, he is confusing subject and subjectivization. Lacan is here to be opposed to the discourse theory doxa about the subject as an effect of the process of subjectivization. For Lacan, the subject precedes subjectivization. Subjectivization, the constitution of the subject's inner life of experience, is a defense against the subject. As such, the subject is a precondition of the process of subjectivization, in the same sense in which, back in the 1960s, Herbert Marcuse claimed that freedom is the condition of liberation. Insofar as, in a way, the subject, in its content, is nothing positively but the result of the process of subjectivization, one can also say that the subject precedes itself. In order to become subject, it already has to be subject, so that, in its process of becoming, it becomes what it already is. And, incidentally, this feature distinguishes the properly Hegelian dialectical process from pseudo-Hegelian dialectical evolution. The obvious counter-argument to this is that we are dealing here with the archetypal case of ideological illusion. There is no subject prior to the process of subjectivization. Its pre-existence is precisely the inversion that bears witness to the success of the ideological constitution of the subject. Once constituted, the subject necessarily experiences itself as the cause of the very process that constitutes it. That is, it perceives this process as its expression. This, precisely, is the reasoning one should reject. But why, exactly? Let us return for a brief moment to Althusser. In Althusserian terms, the subject is constituted through its assumption of an ideological call through recognizing itself in ideological interpolation. This recognition subjectifies the pre-ideological individual. Of course, as is clear to Critchley, this interpolation, the assumption of the call of the good, ultimately always fails. The subject cannot ever act at the level of this call. Its endeavors always fall short. It is here that, from the Lacanian perspective, one should supplement the Althusserian account. The subject, in a way, is the failure of subjectivization, 
the failure of assuming the symbolic mandate, of fully identifying with the ethical call. To paraphrase Althusser's celebrated formula, an individual is interpolated into subjecthood. This interpolation fails, and the subject is this failure. This is why the subject is irreducibly divided, divided between its task and the failure to remain faithful to it. It is in this sense that, for Lacan, the subject is as such hysterical. Hysteria is, at its most elementary, the failure of interpolation, the gnawing worm questioning the identity imposed on the subject by interpolation. Why am I that name? Why am I what the big other claims I am? When Critchley emphasizes how the subject always fails with regard to the call of the ethical thing, he seems to fully endorse this dimension, this failure as constitutive of subjectivity. There is, however, a crucial accent to be added here. It is totally wrong to directly identify this failure of interpolation, the fact that the subject never rises to the level of its responsibility towards the call of the good with the subject. What accounts for this failure is not simply the limitation of the subject's finitude, its inadequacy to the infinitely demanding task. That is, we are not dealing with the simple gap between the subject's infinite ethical task and its finite reality, which makes it forever inadequate to this task. The subject before subjectivization is a positive force in itself, the infinite force of negativity called by Freud the death drive, which is why, from the Lacanian perspective, it is problematic to claim that we humans seem to have enormous difficulty in accepting our limitedness, our finiteness, and this failure is a cause of much tragedy. On the contrary, we humans have enormous difficulty in accepting the infinity, undeadness, excess of life, in the very core of our being, the strange immortality whose Freudian name is the death drive. The ethical call does not intervene directly upon the human animal, disturbing its balance with its infinitely demanding injunction. The ethical call, on the contrary, already presupposes that the balance of animal reproduction is thrown off the rails, becomes out of joint, through the transformation of the animal instinct into the death drive. Consequently, ethics is, for Lacan, not directly the zero level of the encounter with the real thing. It is, rather, already a screen which protects us from the destructive impact of the real. It is here that Critchley falsifies in a strange way Lacan's notions of the good and the beautiful from the ethics of psychoanalysis, in that he posits the beautiful as the screen that protects us from the direct exposure to the real thing. Whereas for Lacan, the good occupies precisely the same structural place. That is, it is not the real thing itself, but a screen protecting us from its blinding impact. For Critchley, the traumatic intrusion of the radically heterogeneous real thing, which decenters the subject, is identical with the ethical call of the good. While for Lacan, the radically heterogeneous thing, whose traumatic impact decenters the subject, is, on the contrary, the primordial evil thing something that cannot ever be sublated, aufgehoben, into a version of the good, something which forever remains a disturbing cut. This is where Critchley's reference to Saad falls short. He claims that the Saadian project still fits the coordinates of the commitment to the good. Saad simply puts what we perceive as to its content as evil at the place of the good. In other words, for Saad, the unbridled use of others as a means of sexual enjoyment is his good, to which he is totally committed or to quote Satan from Milton's Paradise Lost, evil be thou my good. One should rather invert this notion that evil is a content whose very form, the unconditional ethical commitment, remains that of the good. The difference between good and evil is not that of content, but that of form. But again, not in the sense that good is the form of unconditional commitment to a cause, and evil the betrayal of this commitment. It is, on the contrary, the very unconditional fanatical commitment to a cause which is the death drive at its purest and, as such, the primordial form of evil. It introduces into the flow of social life a violent cut that throws it out of joint. The good comes afterwards. It is an attempt to gentrify, to domesticate, the traumatic impact of the evil thing. In short, the good is the screened, domesticated evil. Was Kant himself not on the tracks of this paradox in the deadlock of his notions of radical and diabolical evil? Rousseau had already noted that egoism, or the concern for one's well-being, is not opposed to the common good, 
since altruistic norms can easily be deduced from egotistic concerns. Individualism versus communitarianism, utilitarianism versus the assertion of universal norms, are false oppositions, since the two opposed options amount to the same in their result. The critics who complain how, in today's hedonistic, egotistic society, true values are lacking totally miss the point. The true opposite of egotistic self-love is not altruism, a concern for the common good, but envy, resentiment, which makes me act against my own interests. The conservative or communitarian critics complain that the ethics one can generate from utilitarian individualist premises can only be a pact between wolves, who conclude it is in the best interest of each of them to constrain their aggressivity rather than genuine solidarity and altruism. But they miss the ironic point. What utilitarian ethics cannot properly account for is not the true good, but evil itself, which is ultimately against my long-term interests. The humorous superego and its politics of resistance. Which form of political practice best fits this notion of subjectivity? Since, on the one hand, the liberal democratic state is here to stay, that is, since the attempts to abolish the state failed miserably, and since, on the other hand, the motivational deficit with regard to the institutions of liberal democracy is irreducible, the new politics has to be located at a distance from the state, a politics of resistance to the state, of bombarding the state with impossible demands, of denouncing the limitations of state mechanisms. The main argument for the extra-statal status of the politics of resistance is its link to the metapolitical ethical dimension of the infinitely demanding call for justice. Every state politics has to betray this infinity, since its ultimate goal is the real political one of securing the state's reproduction, its economic growth, public safety, and so on. This is Antigone versus Creon. Creon stands for the raison d'etat. His concern is a totally respectable one, that of preventing another round of civil war which may destroy the city. As such, he has to oppose Antigone, whose unconditional ethical demand ignores the mortal threat its fulfillment poses to the city. Critchley refers positively to the young Marxist critique of Hegel, where Marx opposes the true democracy of the social link of free people to the state as the imposed unity. However, in contrast to Marx, whose aim is to abolish the state for this reason, for Critchley, true democracy is only possible as the interstitial distance within the state. Such a true democracy calls the state into question and calls the established order to account, not in order to do away with the state, desirable though that may well be in some utopian sense, but in order to better it or attenuate its malicious effect. Such politics is negative in the sense that it should not seek to set itself up as the new hegemonic principle of political organization, but remains the negation of totality and not the affirmation of a new totality. Anarchy is a radical disturbance of the state, a disruption of the state's attempt to set itself up or erect itself into a whole. Thus, democracy is not a fixed political form of society, but rather the deformation of society from itself through the act of material political manifestation. If, then, politics, as the aesthetic carnivalesque manifestation of the anarchic demos and democracy are two names for the same thing, what does this mean for democracy as the state form? When Critchley writes that the motivational deficit with regard to the institutions of liberal democracy, the growing indifference towards elections and so on, has also had positive effects, giving rise to a series of non-electoral political activities, of NGOs, of social movements such as the anti-globalization movement, the indigenous rights movements in Mexico and Australia, and so forth, his position becomes ambiguous. Is it actually better for emancipatory politics if people are not committed to the democratic institutions? So what then should, say, the Democrats do in the US? Should they withdraw, subtract themselves from competing for the state power into the interstices of state? leaving state power to Republicans, and engage in anarchistic resistance to it. Of course, history is habitually written by the people with the guns and sticks, and one cannot expect to defeat them with mocking satire and feather dusters. Yet, as the history of ultra-leftist active nihilism eloquently shows, one is lost the moment one picks up the guns and sticks. 
anarchic political resistance should not seek to mimic and mirror the archic violent sovereignty it opposes. But Critchley would certainly support picking up the guns and sticks when one faces an adversary like Hitler, would he not? Surely in this case one should mimic and mirror the archic violent sovereignty one opposes. So what should the left do? Distinguish the cases when one joins forces with the state in resorting to violence from the cases when all one can do and should do is use mocking satire and feather dusters? When Critchley writes that one should approach Al-Qaeda with the words and actions of bin Laden resonating against those of Lenin, Blanqui, Mao, and makes the same point at the book's conclusion with the claim that neo-Leninism is practically expressed in the vanguardism of groups like Al-Qaeda, he engages in the purest ideological formalism, blurring the crucial difference between two opposed political logics, radical egalitarian violence, what Badiou calls the eternal idea of the politics of revolutionary justice at work from the ancient Chinese legists through Jacobins to Lenin and Mao, and anti-modernist fundamentalist violence, a new version of the old liberal conservative identification of right and left totalitarianism. Furthermore, according to Critchley, not only is the state here to stay, the same holds for capitalism itself. Capitalist dislocation in its ruthless destruction of the bonds of tradition, local belonging, family and kinship structures that one might have considered natural reveals the contingency of social life, that is, its structured character, which is to say its political articulation. Once the ideological illusions of the natural have been stripped away and revealed as contingent formations by capitalist dislocation, where freedom, for example, becomes the precarious experience of insecurity when one sells oneself on a labour market, then the only cement that holds political identities together is a hegemonic link. The unintended implication of this reasoning is that the very anti-essentialist experience of social life as contingent, with every identity the result of discursive articulation, the outcome of an open struggle for hegemony, is grounded in the essentialist predominance of capitalism, which itself no longer appears as one of possible modes of production, but as simply the neutral background of the open process of contingent re-articulations. According to this view, capitalism means permanent multiple dislocations, and this dislocation opens up the space for the formation of new political subjectivities. However, it is no longer possible to contain these subjectivities under the heading of the proletariat. Multiple dislocations clear the space for multiple subjectivities, threatened indigenous populations, sexual and ethnic minorities, slum dwellers, and so on. And what we should aim at is the chain of equivalences between these series of demands grievances. As an exemplary case of creating a new political subjectivity through an act of naming, Critchley celebrates the impoverished Mexican peasants' reinvention as indigenous people. Is it not, however, that his example demonstrates its own limitations. As his own analysis makes clear, the poor peasants had to reinvent, rename themselves as the indigenous people because the successful neoliberal ideological offensive had made a direct reference to the economic position of being exploited, untenable, ineffective. In our post-political epoch of the culturalization of the political, the only way to formulate one's complaint is that the level of cultural and or ethnic demands Exploited workers become immigrants whose otherness is oppressed, and so forth. The price we pay for this operation is at least a minimal level of ideological mystification. What the poor peasants are defending appears as their natural, ethnic, substantial identity. The contemporary liberal democratic state and the infinitely demanding anarchistic politics are thus engaged in a relationship of mutual parasitism, the state externalizes its ethical self-consciousness in an extra-statal ethico-political agency, and this agency externalizes its claim to effectiveness in the state. Anarchic agents do the ethical thinking for the state, and the state does the work of really running and regulating society. The way Critchley's anarchic ethico-political agent relates to the superego is double. Not only is it crushed by the superego, it also acts itself like a superego agent, comfortably bombarding the state with superego demands, and the state is all the more guilty, the more it tries to comply with its demands. In compliance with this superego logic, the anarchic extra-statal agents focus their protests not on open dictatorships, but on the hypocrisy of liberal democracies, which are accused of not following consistently their own ideological norms. 
What Critchley offers is thus liberal capitalist democracy with a human face. We remain firmly within the Fukuyama universe, or to paraphrase Thomas de Quincey's Simple Art of Murder, look how many people started with a wrong reading of Lacan and ended up celebrating Princess Diana as a figure of insurgency. The lesson here is that the truly subversive thing is not to insist on infinite demands we know those in power cannot fulfill, since they also know that we know it, such an infinitely demanding attitude is easily acceptable for those in power. So wonderful that, with your critical demands, you remind us what kind of world we would all like to live in. Unfortunately, however, we live in the real world, where we are just honestly doing what is possible. But, on the contrary, to bombard those in power with strategically well-selected, precise, finite demands, which cannot allow for the same excuse. Goodbye, Mr. Resisting Nomad. In contrast to Critchley, Tony Negri is the most representative version of the heroic attempt to stick to fundamental Marxist coordinates and to demonstrate how the very postmodern turn of capitalism, the rise of the post-industrial society, with its shift towards informational work, creates the conditions for revolutionizing society even more radically than Marx imagined it opening up the possibility of absolute democracy. Negri's starting point is a rather standard one. Today, immaterial cognitive work plays the key role in creating new value, and since these cognitive aspects of work predominate, one can no longer measure value with time, labour time. So, the Marxist notion of exploitation is no longer operative. Now, it has to be noted immediately that today there is no production of value, if not immaterial value, which is carried out by free brains capable of innovation. Freedom is the only value that doesn't simply reproduce wealth, but that puts it into circulation. Today's basic productive force is thus the cognitariat, the multitude of cognitive workers. Their work produces freedom, and their freedom is productive. Freedom is the fixed capital that is inside the brain of the people. This, then, is our situation. The subaltern classes are already classes with a fixed capital rich than that of the bosses, a spiritual patrimony more important than what the others boast, and an absolute weapon, the knowledge essential for the reproduction of the world. Instead, today, when the general intellect becomes hegemonic in capitalist production, when, that is, immaterial and cognitive labour become immediately productive, intellectual labour power now frees itself from this relation of subjection, and the productive subject appropriates for itself those labour instruments that capital preconstituted before. We can say that variable capital represents itself as fixed capital. I am productive outside of my relation with capital, and the flow of cognitive and social capital no longer has anything to do with capital as a physical structure in the hands of the bosses. The idea is thus that, with the hegemonic role of the general intellect, capital loses its function of socially organising production, of bringing together fixed and variable capital, the means of production and the labour force. Its function is now purely parasitic, which is why it finally becomes possible to lop it off. It is no longer even a question of a violent cut into the social texture, since production and social life itself are progressively organised. The multitude has simply to pursue its work of self-organisation, and capital will all of a sudden notice that it is suspended in the air and will crash down, like the cartoon cat walking in the air above a precipice and falling into the abyss beneath its feet when it looks down and notices that the ground is no longer there. The key category here is that of the formal and real subsumption of production under capital. In clear contrast to the evolutionary logic of the changes in relations of production following the development of the means of production, Marx emphasizes how formal subsumption precedes the real form. Capitalists first only formally subsume the production process to their rule, providing raw materials and buying the product from individual artisans who continue to produce the way they did before this subsumption. It is only afterwards that the subsumption becomes material, that is, that the means and organisation of production are directly formed by capital, 
the introduction of machinery, the factory division of labor, Fordism, and so on. This process reaches its culmination in large-scale mechanized factory production, in which the subordination of the worker to capital is directly reproduced in the very material organization of the production process. The worker is materially reduced to a cog in the machine, performing a particular task, with no overview of the entire production process and no idea of the scientific knowledge that sustains it. Both knowledge and organization are on the side of capital. Here is Marx's description from the Grundrisse. The accumulation of knowledge and of skill of the general productive forces of the social brain is thus absorbed into capital, as opposed to labor, and hence appears as an attribute of capital, and more specifically of fixed capital, insofar as it enters into the production process as a means of production proper. Machinery appears, then, as the most adequate form of fixed capital, and fixed capital, insofar as capital's relations with itself are concerned, appears as the most adequate form of capital as such. However, with the post fordist shift to the hegemonic role of cognitive labor, knowledge and organization are again reappropriated by the collective of workers, so that, in a kind of negation of the negation, capital once again subsumes production in a purely formal way. Its role is more and more purely parasitic, trying to control and regulate a process fully able to run itself. The problem with Negri and Hart here is that they are too Marxist, taking over the underlying Marxist schema of historical progress. Like Marx, they celebrate the deterritorializing revolutionary potential of capitalism. Like Marx, they locate the contradiction within capitalism in the gap between this potential and the form of capital, of the private property appropriation of the surplus. In short, they rehabilitate the old Marxist notion of the tension between productive forces and the relations of production. Capitalism already generates the germs of the future new forms of life. It incessantly produces the new commons, so that in a revolutionary explosion, this new is simply to be liberated from the old social form. Here, they remain Deleuzean. When Deleuze and Guattari wrote in Anti-Oedipus that by striving to reach the furthest limit of deterritorialization, a schizophrenic seeks out the very limit of capitalism. He is its inherent tendency brought to fulfillment. Do they thereby not confirm that their own socio-political project is a desperate attempt to realize capitalism's own inherent fantasy, its virtual coordinates? Is communism thereby not reduced to what none other than Bill Gates called frictionless capitalism? Capitalism elevated and intensified to the infinite speed of circulation. No wonder that Negri had recently praised postmodern digital capitalism, claiming that it is already communist and that it needs just a little push, a formal gesture, to openly become such. The basic strategy of contemporary capital is to cover up its superfluousness by finding new ways to once again subsume the free productive multitude. If fixed capital is now singularly capable of imagination, in order to put it to work, there is the need of a new machine. This is the paradoxical communism of capital, the attempt to close, by means of financialization, the global machine of production, above and beyond the productive singularities that compose it. It is the attempt to subsume the multitude. There is a feature of this account which cannot but strike the eye. According to philosophical common sense, when one neglects philosophical reflection, the result is that one finds oneself relying on the worst and most naive philosophical framework. Mutatis mutandis, the same rule holds for ferocious anti-Hegelians. It is as if the revenge for their total rejection of Hegel is that they unknowingly use the most superficial Hegelian categories. This accounts for a detail which effectively functions as a symptom of Negri's work. His unconstrained and unreflexive one is almost tempted to say wild, in the sense of wild psychoanalysis, use of Hegelian categories, which so blatantly contradicts his professed anti-Hegelianism. For example, the contemporary multitude is in itself, but not for itself, and the transition isn't easy. It is an alternation of moments, of taking conscience of some and not of others, of a totality of transitions, interruptions of tendencies and of drifts, is this not a strange reliance on the Hegelian couplet of the in itself and the for itself? Should, then, we be surprised that, when, in their empire, Negri and Harp refer to Bartleby as the figure of resistance, 
of the no to the existing universe of social machinery, they interpret Bartleby's I would prefer not to as merely the first move of, as it were, clearing the decks, of acquiring a distance towards the existing social universe. What is then needed is a move towards the long-term work of constructing a new community. If we remain stuck at the Bartleby stage, we end up in a suicidal marginal position with no consequences. In short, for them, Bartleby's I would prefer not to is a Hegelian abstract negation, which should then be overcome by the patient positive work of the determinate negation of the existing social universe. The pointedness of this Hegelian formulation is intentional. Negri and Hart, the two great anti-Hegelians, make, apropos Bartleby, the most standard pseudo-Hegelian critical point. The irony is that Negri refers here to the process which the ideologists of contemporary postmodern capitalism themselves celebrate as the passage from material to symbolic production, from the centralist hierarchical logic to the logic of autopoietic self-organization, multi-centered cooperation, and so forth. Negri is here indeed faithful to Marx. What he tries to prove is that Marx was right, that the rise of the general intellect is, in the long term, incompatible with capitalism. The ideologists of postmodern capitalism make the exactly opposite claim. It is Marxist theory and practice which remains within the constraints of hierarchical, centralized state control logic, and thus cannot cope with the social effects of the new informational revolution. There are good empirical reasons for this claim. Again, the supreme irony of history is that the disintegration of communism is the most convincing example of the validity of the traditional Marxist dialectic of forces and relations of production, a dialectic on which Marxism counted in its endeavor to overcome capitalism. What indeed ruined the communist regimes was their inability to accommodate the new social logic sustained by the informational revolution. They tried to steer this revolution as yet another large-scale, centralized state planning project. The paradox is thus that what Negri celebrates as the unique chance for overcoming capitalism, the ideologists of informational revolution eulogize as the rise of the new frictionless capitalism. Who, then, is right here? What is the role of capital in informational society? Negri's basic reference, the famous passage about the general intellect from Marx's Grundrisse, is worth quoting in extenso. In it, Marx deploys a logic of the self-overcoming of capitalism, which he totally abstracts from the active revolutionary struggle. It is formulated in purely economic terms. Capitalism itself is the moving contradiction, in that it presses to reduce labour time to a minimum, while it posits labour time, on the other side, as sole measure and source of wealth. The contradiction which will ruin capitalism is thus the contradiction between the capitalist exploitation, which relies on labor time as the sole source of value, and thus the sole source of surplus value, and the scientific technological progress which leads to quantitative and qualitative reduction of the role of direct labor. This labor is reduced both quantitatively to a smaller proportion and qualitatively as an, of course, indispensable but subordinate moment compared to general scientific labor, technological application of natural sciences on one side, and to the general productive force arising from social combination, Gleidung, in total production on the other side, a combination which appears as a natural fruit of social labor, although it is a historic product. Capital thus works towards its own dissolution as the form dominating production. To the degree that large industry develops, the creation of real wealth comes to depend less on labor time and on the amount of labor employed than on the power of the agency set in motion during labor time, whose powerful effectiveness is itself in turn out of all proportion to the direct labor time spent on their production, but depends rather on the general state of science and on the progress of technology, or the application of this science to production. Marx's vision is here that of a fully automated production process in which the human being, the worker, comes to relate more as watchman and regulator to the production process itself. No longer does the worker insert a modified natural thing, Naturgegenstand, as middle link between the object, object, and himself. Rather, he inserts the process of nature, transformed into an industrial process,
as a means between himself and inorganic nature, mastering it. He steps to the side of the production process instead of being its chief actor. In this transformation, it is neither the direct human labor he himself performs, nor the time during which he works, but rather the appropriation of his own general productive power, his understanding of nature, and his mastery over it by virtue of his presence as a social body. It is, in a word, the development of the social individual which appears as the great foundation stone of production and of wealth. The theft of alien labour time, on which the present wealth is based, appears a miserable foundation in face of this new one, created by large-scale industry itself. As soon as labour, in the direct form, has ceased to be the great wellspring of wealth, labour time ceases and must cease to be its measure. Crucial is here the radical transformation of the status of fixed capital. The development of fixed capital indicates to what degree general social knowledge has become a direct force of production, and to what degree, hence, the conditions of the process of social life itself have come under the control of the general intellect and been transformed in accordance with it. To what degree the powers of social production have been produced, not only in the form of knowledge, but also as immediate organs of social practice, of the real life process. What this means is that, with the development of general social knowledge, the productive power of labour is itself the greatest productive power. From the standpoint of the direct production process, it can be regarded as the production of fixed capital, this fixed capital being man himself. And again, since capital organises its exploitation by appearing as fixed capital against living labour, the moment the key component of fixed capital is man himself, its general social knowledge. The very social foundation of capitalist exploitation is undermined, and the role of capital becomes purely parasitic. Today, capital can no longer exploit the worker. It can only exploit cooperation amongst workers, amongst laborers. Today, capital has no longer that internal function for which it became the soul of common labor, which produced that abstraction within which progress was made. Today, capital is parasitical because it is no longer inside. It is outside of the creative capacity of the multitude. Negri's idea is that this immaterial labor opens up the possibility of absolute democracy. It cannot be enslaved because it is immediately in itself the form and practice of social freedom. In it, form and content coincide. It is immediately free inventive, creative, an expression of the subject's productivity, active, not reactive, and socialized, always participating in common, cooperative in its very content. This is why it renders capital parasitical, since it is directly socialized. It no longer needs capital to confer on it the form of universality. Exploitation is today essentially the capitalist expropriation of the cooperative power that the singularities of cognitive labor deploy in the social process. It isn't capital anymore that organizes labor, but labor that organizes itself in itself. This notion of the direct productivity of social life itself leads Negri to assert biopolitics in manner different from Agamben. Biopolitics means that human life itself is the direct topic and product of collective labor. It is precisely this directly biopolitical character of production which enables absolute democracy. Biopolitical power, potenza, is therefore contrasted to biopower. As we have noted, is this gesture of Negri not the last in the long Marxist series of identifications of a moment in the social relations of production and or of technology itself as the moment that capitalism will no longer be able to integrate and consequently which will, in the long term, lead to its demise. For Negri, what is new in the postmodern capitalism of today is the very direct overlapping of the two dimensions, material production and its social form. New social relations are the essence and goal of production. In other words, production is increasingly directly socialized, socialized in its very content, which is why it no longer needs the social form of capital imposed onto it. Negri passes all too quickly over the fact that what characterizes our time is biocapitalism, 
which, in the narrower sense, designates the immense field of new capitalist investments into the direct production of new forms of biological life, from genetically modified crops to the human genome. Surely the first task of the Marxist approach here should be to redefine in more stringent terms the notion of the exploitation of intellectual labour. In what precise theoretical sense is, say, Bill Gates exploiting thousands of programmers who work for him if his exploitation is no longer the theft of alien labour time? Is his role really purely parasitical upon the self-organisation of the programmers? Does his capital not, in a more substantial way, provide the very social space for their cooperation? And in what precise sense is the intellectual labour the source of value, if the ultimate measure of value is no longer time? Is the category of value still applicable here? Negri's thesis, reduced to its core, is thus that, with the development of cyber technologies, the primary means of production and profit is no longer the exploitation of labour, but the harvesting of information. With this shift, it becomes possible to liberate labour from within the limits of capitalist production, since the exchange of harvested information on the market no longer relies on the exploitation of labour, that is, on the appropriation of surplus value. The current problem of political economy is to consider human beings when they live and not only when they work, as human beings are always producers. Always, that is, in any moment of life. How is the exploitation of life thinkable? It is not. With today's global interactive media, creative inventiveness is no longer individual. It is immediately collectivized, part of the commons. So any attempt to privatize it through copywriting is problematic, more and more literally. Property is theft here. So what about a company like Microsoft, which does precisely this? organizing and exploiting the collective synergy of creative cognitive singularities. The only remaining task is thus to conceive of how cognitive workers will be able to blow the bosses away because the industrial command of cognitive labor is completely dépassé. What new social movements signal is that the epoch of wage labor is finished and that the struggle has moved from the level of a fight between labor and capital regarding the wage to a fight between the multitude and the state around the citizen's income. Therein resides the basic feature of today's social revolutionary transition. There is the need to make capital aware of the common good, and if it doesn't want to understand it, it is necessary to impose it. Note Negri's precise formulation, not abolish capital, but compel it to recognize the common good. One remains thus within capitalism. From this brief description, one can see the proximity as well as the difference between Marx and Negri. What is not in Marx, what Negri projects onto Marx's general intellect, is his own central notion of biopolitics, as the direct production of life itself in its social dimension. Where Negri sees a direct fusion with cognitive work, the ultimate objects of production are social relations themselves, Marx posits a radical gap, the exclusion of the worker from the production process. Marx envisages a fully automated production process in which the worker steps to one side and is reduced to its watchman and regulator. What this unequivocally means is that the underlying logic is here that of the cunning of reason. Instead of engaging himself directly in the production process, man steps aside and lets nature work upon itself. That is, when he no longer uses tools to work on the objects he wants to transform. When, instead, he inserts the process of nature, transformed into an industrial process, as a means between himself and inorganic nature, mastering it. He turns into a wise manipulator, regulating the production process from a safe distance. Marx's systematic use of the singular, man, the worker, is a key indicator of how the general intellect is not intersubjective, it is monological. This is why, in the Marxian vision, the objects of the production process are precisely not social relations themselves. The administration of things, control of and domination over nature, is here separated from the relations between people. It constitutes a domain of the admiration of things, 
which no longer has to rely on the domination of a people. From a postmodern view, it would be tempting to read this discrepancy between Marx and Negri as an indication of how Marx remained stuck in the old paradigm of centralized instrumental reason, which controls and regulates the production process from the outside. However, there is also a moment of truth in Marx's description, which is obfuscated by Negri, the remaining radical duality of the production process. Today, this duality has acquired a form which was not envisaged by Marx. The kingdom of freedom, the domain of cognitive work, and the kingdom of necessity, the domain of material production, are physically separated, often even by state borders. On the one side are the postmodern companies that exemplify Negri's criteria, free communities of expressive multitudes, which immediately produce life forms, and so on. On the other side, there is the material production process, where full automization is far from achieved, so that we have, often literally on the other side of the world, sweatshops with a strict Fordist organization of labor, where thousands assemble computers and toys, pick bananas or coffee beans, mine for coal or diamonds, and so forth. There is no teleology here, no prospect of sweatshops becoming gradually integrated into the free space of cognitive work. Outsourcing being more rule than exception, the two sides do not even directly relate to each other. They are brought together, mediated, precisely by capital. For each side, the opposite side appears as capital. For the crowds in the sweatshops, capital is the power which, on behalf of cognitive work, employs them to materialize its results. For the cognitive workers, capital is the power which employs them in order to use their results as the blueprints for material production. It is because of this duality, neglected by Negri, that capital is not yet purely parasitic, but still plays a key role in the organization of production. It brings the two sides together. Negri in Davos Negri is right apropos of forums such as Davos. They are the enlightened capitalists' general intellect, the space for formulating their general interest, the space to listen to other voices, to confront ecology, poverty, and so on, to expound on problems of spirituality and the rest, with a view to combining the struggle against pollution and poverty, or whatever it may be, with capitalism. This really is communist capitalism, capitalism which tries to include the communist topic of the endangered commons. The very fact of the importance of Davos Forum, much more than the old Trilateral Commission, its predecessor, the need for a forum like Davos is proof of the crisis of capitalism, of the threat of the commons. Davos is the collective brain of the empire, its think tank. Negri even proposed to Davos a strategic pact against the American project, although in the long term, the multitude and Davos are enemies. In the short term, they share the interest of defeating the US coup d'etat against the global empire. A strange logic indeed. Instead of exploiting the inconsistency of the enemy, one helps him establish the most effective form. To put it in other words, what if the very idea of a pure empire, which leaves behind the nation-state form, and in which the capitalist general intellect runs things directly, is an impossible abstraction? What if the role of nation-states is irreducible and crucial, and with it, the temptation of some nation states to carry out coup d'etat against the empire, so that the exception, the excessive role of a nation state in the empire, is in fact the rule. Negri here is not Leninist enough. To put it in Deleuzean terms already evoked, Lenin's moment is the dark precursor, the vanishing mediator, the displaced object never in its own place between the two series, the initial orthodox Marxian series of revolution in the most developed countries, and the new orthodox series of Stalinist socialism in one country, and then the Maoist identification of the third world nations with the new world proletariat. The shift from Lenin to Stalinism here is clear and easy to determine. Lenin perceived the situation as desperate, 
unexpected, but as such, one which had to be creatively exploited for new political choices. With the notion of socialism in one country, Stalin renormalized the situation into a new narrative of linear development in stages. That is to say, while Lenin was fully aware that an anomaly had happened, revolution in a country which does not have the presuppositions for developing a socialist society, he rejected the vulgar revolutionist conclusion that revolution had taken place prematurely, so that one should take a step back in order to develop a modern democratic capitalist society, which would then slowly create the conditions for socialist revolution, claiming that, to refer back to the crucial passage we quoted earlier, this very complete hopelessness of the situation offers the opportunity to create the fundamental requisites of civilization in a different way from that of the West European countries. What Lenin is proposing here is effectively an implicit theory of alternate history, under the premature domination of the force of the future, the same necessary historical process of modern civilization can be rerun in a different way. Perhaps this attitude is today more relevant than ever. The situation is completely hopeless, with no clear realistic revolutionary perspective. But does this not give us a kind of strange freedom, a freedom to experiment? One has only to throw away the deterministic model of objective necessities and obligatory stages of development. One has thus to sustain a minimum of anti-determinism. Nothing is ever written off in an objective situation which precludes any act, which condemns us fully to biopolitical vegetation. There is always a space to be created for an act, precisely because, to paraphrase Rosa Luxemburg's critique of reformism, it is not enough to wait patiently for the right moment of the revolution. If one merely waits for it, it will never come, for one has to start with premature attempts which, therein resides the pedagogy of the revolution, in their very failure to achieve their professed goal, create the subjective conditions for the right moment. Recall Mao's slogan, from defeat to defeat to the final victory, which echoes in Beckett's already quoted motto, try again, fail again, fail better. In this precise sense, Lenin was a Beckettian avant la lettre. What he basically proposed that the Bolsheviks should do in the desperate situation at the end of the Civil War was not to directly construct socialism, but to fail better than a normal bourgeois state. It holds also for the revolutionary process that, to paraphrase Derrida's well-known dictum once again, the condition of impossibility is the condition of possibility. The condition of impossibility, Russian backwardness and isolation which made socialism impossible, is part of the same exceptional situation which made the first socialist revolution possible. In other words, instead of bemoaning the historical anomaly of a revolution in an exceptional and immature situation, with the expectation that the revolution would start in the most developed capitalist countries, one should bear in mind that revolution never arrives on time, when the objective social process generates the mature conditions for it. The point of Lenin's famous notion of the weakest link in the chain is, again, that one should use the anomaly as a lever to exacerbate the antagonisms so that they render possible a revolutionary explosion. Negri is also right to point out that, in this new global order, Wars in the old sense of the term are less and less feasible. What we refer to as wars are police interventions of a global state into an area which is experienced as a threat to the global order. War and politics are combined in military policing, in imposing order in a chaotic area. It is, paradoxically, Bush's politics which has continued the tradition of old wars, being an attempt by a nation-state to carry out a coup d'etat against the empire, to subordinate the empire. With regard to the empire, it is the US which is the banana republic. Here, however, Negri becomes ambiguous. On the one hand, he is clear that the capitalist general intellect is, in the long term, the true enemy. On the other hand, apropos Lula, he supports the policies which aim at breaking US hegemony and at establishing a pluricentric global capitalism. The US, Europe with maybe Russia, China and the Far East, Latin America and so on. Contrary to misleading appearances, the American century is over, and we are already entering the period of the formation of multiple centers of global capitalism. Is the fact that, on his visit to the US in April 2006, the Chinese president was first the guest of Bill Gates, not a sign of these new times. So perhaps, in this new era, 
Each of the new centres will stand for capitalism with a specific twist. The US for neoliberal capitalism, Europe with maybe Russia for what remains of the welfare state, China for Eastern values and authoritarian capitalism, Latin America for populist capitalism. After the failure of the US attempt to impose itself as the sole superpower, the universal policeman, there is now the need to establish the rules of interaction between these local centres in case of conflicting interests. Although Emmanuel Todd's vision of the contemporary global order is clearly one-sided, it is difficult to deny its moment of truth that the US is an empire in decline. Its growing negative balance of trade demonstrates that the US is the unproductive predator. It has to suck up an influx of $1 billion a day from other nations to meet its consumption needs, and is, as such, the universal Keynesian consumer that keeps the world economy running. So much for the anti-Keynesian economic ideology that seems to predominate today. This influx, which is effectively like the tithe paid to Rome in antiquity, relies on a complex economic mechanism. The US is trusted as the safe and stable centre, so that all others, from the oil-producing Arab countries to Western Europe and Japan, and now even China, invest their surplus profits in the US. Since this trust is primarily ideological and military, not economic, the problem for the US is how to justify its imperial role. It needs a permanent state of war, so it had to invent the war on terror, offering itself as the universal protector of all other normal, non-rogue states. The entire globe thus tends to function as a universal Sparta with three classes, now emerging as the first, second and third worlds. One the US as the military, political, ideological power. Two, Europe and parts of Asia and Latin America as the industrial and manufacturing region. Crucial here are Germany and Japan, the world's leading exporters, plus rising China. Three, the undeveloped rest, today's helots. In other words, global capitalism has brought about a new general trend towards oligarchy, masked as the celebration of the diversity of cultures. Equality and universalism are rapidly disappearing as actual political principles. However, even before it has fully established itself, this neo-Spartan world system is breaking down. In contrast to 1945, the world does not need the US. It is the US which needs the world. Since the world of today is composed of too many regional centers which cannot be controlled, the only thing the US can do to assert itself as the global military power is to engage in theatrical wars or crises with weak adversaries – Iraq, Cuba, Korea, Iran – not with true alternative centres of power – China, Russia. The violent outbursts of the recent Bush administration are thus not exercises in power, but rather exercises in panic – irrational passage à l'acte. Perhaps this focus on thwarting the US coup d'etat against empire accounts for Negri's strange elevation of Lula at the expense of Chavez. There doesn't exist in Latin America an alternative to the political project promised by Lula and the Brazilian PT. Now, above all recently, the Bolivarian Venezuela of Chavez was presented as an alternative to the project of Lula. But it is obvious that this alternative is purely ideological, very abstract. In Venezuela in particular, the relationship between political power and the capacity of developing economic productive alternatives still seems to be in deficit. So what are these achievements of Lula's? Negri mentions only too that Lula governs in a direct dialogue with the movements, and that he is practicing new measures, paying off the IMF debt, and so on to ensure the government's autonomy from international capital. Negri himself admits that this goal of establishing a new international equilibrium has priority over the struggle against social inequalities. So what will happen when the US coup d'etat is defeated and the general intellect will run the empire? Here enters another weird feature. 
Negri's unexpected Eurocentrism. In a subsequent period, when global multilateralism is stabilized and aristocratic global representations are determined on a continental basis, Europe will become the only democratic mediator within this new global constitution. We need Europe because of this. Europe is the only occasion for a pluralist and democratic push of real and dynamic transformation at the global level. The problem here is not Eurocentrism as such, but rather the lack of conceptual justification. Why exactly is only Europe capable of triggering a pluralist and democratic push of real and dynamic transformation at the global level? Deleuze without Negri. Negri's Eurocentrism is discernible already in the opposition between expression and representation on which his entire thought is based. The logic of political representation, the state or political parties as representing people versus the logic of expression, social movements expressing the free creativity of the multitude. Representation deals with individuals who are represented in the universal sphere, marked by the gap between their empirical particularity and their transcendental or legal universality. Singularities are atoms which are directly interactive and productive, expressing their creative power. Philosophically, this means Descartes' Kant versus Spinoza. There are clearly discernible echoes here of Sartre's notion of the practico-inert, developed in his critique of dialectical reason. The theoretical problem here is, can one imagine a society fully organized in terms of expression of the multitude, a society of absolute democracy, a society without representation, a society of permanent mobilization, a society in which every objective structure is a direct expression of subjective productivity? What we encounter here is the old philosophical logic of becoming versus being, living productivity versus the sterility of an inert structure of representation, where every representation is parasitical upon productive expressivity. Perhaps one should shift the accent here from no representation without expressive productivity to no expressive productivity without representation. It is structurally impossible to totalize the multitude of movements. Absolute democracy, the full and direct reign of multitude, is a perspectival illusion, a composite image of the false overlapping of two heterogeneous dimensions. Tarkovsky's Solaris ends with the director's archetypal fantasy of combining within the same shot the otherness into which the hero is thrown, the chaotic surface of Solaris, and the object of his nostalgic longing, the home dacha to which he longs to return, the house whose contours are encircled by the malleable slime of Solaris's surface. Within radical otherness, we discover the lost object of our innermost longing. The same phantasmatic staging concludes Tarkovsky's nostalgia. In the midst of the Italian countryside, encircled by the fragments of a cathedral in ruins, that is, of the place in which the hero was adrift, cut off from his roots, there stands an element totally out of place, the Russian dacha, the stuff of the hero's dreams. Here, too, the shot begins with a close-up of only the recumbent hero in front of his dacha, so that for a moment it may seem that he has in fact returned home. The camera then slowly pulls back to divulge the properly phantasmatic setting of the dacha against the backdrop of the Italian countryside. This concluding fantasy is an artificial condensation of opposed, incompatible perspectives, somehow like the standard optician's test in which we see through one eye a cage, through the other eye a parrot, and if our two eyes are well coordinated in their axes, when we open both eyes we should see the parrot in the cage. And what if it is the same with Negri's absolute democracy, for the multitude directly ruling itself? What if the gap between the multitude and power is here to stay? This does not mean that we should abandon Deleuze. What we should abandon is merely Negri's one-sided appropriation of Deleuze, an appropriation which leaves out the radical duality of Deleuze's thought.
There are two incompatible ontologies at work in Deleuze. The Deleuze who celebrates the productive power of the virtual flow is forever haunted by the Deleuze who conceives the virtual flow of sense as a sterile immaterial effect, positing an irreducible gap between material productivity and the virtual flow of sense. The elementary coordinates of Deleuze's ontology are provided by the opposition between the virtual and the actual. The space of the actual, real acts in the present, experienced reality, and subjects as persons qua formed individuals, accompanied by its virtual shadow, the field of proto-reality, of multiple singularities, impersonal elements later synthesized into our experience of reality. This is the Deleuze of transcendental empiricism, the Deleuze who gives to Kant's transcendental his unique twist. The proper transcendental space is the virtual space of multiple singular potentialities, of pure impersonal singular gestures, affects and perceptions that are not yet the gestures, affects, perceptions of a pre-existing, stable and self-identical subject. This is why, for example, Deleuze celebrates the art of cinema. It liberates the gaze images, movements, and ultimately time itself from their attribution to a given subject. When we watch a movie, we see the flow of images from the perspective of the mechanical camera, a perspective which does not belong to any subject. Through the art of montage, movement is also abstracted, liberated from its attribution to a given subject or object. It is an impersonal movement, which is only secondarily, a posteriori, attributed to some positive entities. Here, however, the first crack in this edifice appears. In a move which is far from self-evident, Deleuze links this conceptual space to the traditional opposition between production and representation. The virtual field is reinterpreted as that of generative productive forces, opposed to the space of representations. Here we face all the standard topics of the molecular multiple sites of productivity constrained by the molar totalizing organizations, and so on and so forth. Under the heading of the opposition between becoming and being, Deleuze thus seems to identify these two logics, although they are fundamentally incompatible. One is tempted to attribute the bad influence which pushed him towards the second logic to Felix Guattari. The proper site of production is not the virtual space as such, but rather the very passage from it to constituted reality, the collapse of the multitude and its oscillations into one reality. Production is fundamentally a limitation of the open space of virtualities, the determination negation of the virtual multitude. This is how Deleuze reads Spinoza's Omni Determinatio Est Negatio against Hegel. The line of Deleuze proper is that of the great early monographs, the key ones being Difference and Repetition and the Logic of Sense, as well as some of the shorter introductory writings, like Proust and Signs and the introduction to Saka Masok. In his late work, it is the two cinema books which mark the return to the topics of the logic of sense. This series is to be distinguished from the books Deleuze and Guattari co-wrote, and one can only regret that the Anglo-Saxon reception of Deleuze, and also the political impact of Deleuze, is predominantly that of a Guattarized Deleuze. It is crucial to note that not a single one of Deleuze's own texts is in any way directly political. Deleuze in himself was a highly elitist author, indifferent to politics. The only serious philosophical question is thus, what inherent impasse caused Deleuze to turn towards Guattari? Is Anti-Oedipus, arguably Deleuze's worst book, not the result of escaping the full confrontation of a deadlock via a simplified flat solution? Homologous to Schelling, escaping the deadlock of his Weltalter project via his shift to the duality of positive and negative philosophy, or Habermas escaping the deadlock of the dialectic of enlightenment via his shift to the duality of instrumental and communicative reason. Our task is to confront again this deadlock. Was, therefore, Deleuze not pushed towards Guattari because Guattari presented an alibi, an easy escape from the deadlock of his previous position? Does Deleuze's conceptual structure not rely on two logics, on two conceptual oppositions, which coexist in his work? This insight seems so obvious, stating it so close to what the French call a la palisade, that one is surprised it has not yet been generally perceived. First, on the one hand, the logic of sense, of immaterial becoming as the sense event, as the effect of bodily material processes causes.
the logic of the radical gap between the generative process and its immaterial sense effect. Multiplicities, being incorporeal effects of material causes, are impassable or causally sterile entities. The time of a pure becoming, always already past and eternally yet to come, forms the temporal dimension of this impassibility or sterility of multiplicities. And is cinema not the ultimate case of the sterile flow of surface becoming? The cinematic image is inherently sterile and impassive, the pure effect of corporeal causes, although nonetheless acquiring its pseudo-autonomy. Second, on the other hand, the logic of becoming as the production of beings. The emergence of metric or extensive properties should be treated as a single process in which a continuous virtual space-time progressively differentiates itself into actual discontinuous spatio-temporal structures. In, say, his analyses of film and literature, Deleuze emphasizes the desubstantialization of affects. In a work of art, an affect, boredom, for example, is no longer attributable to actual persons, but becomes a free-floating event. How then does this impersonal intensity of an affect event relate to bodies or persons? Here we encounter the same ambiguity. Either this immaterial affect is generated by interacting bodies as a sterile surface of pure becoming, or it is part of the virtual intensities out of which bodies emerge through actualization, the passage from becoming to being. And is this opposition not, yet again, that of materialism versus idealism? In Deleuze, this means the logic of sense versus anti-Oedipus. Either the sense event, the flow of pure becoming, is the immaterial effect, neutral, neither active nor passive, of the intrication of bodily material causes, or the positive bodily entities are themselves the product of the pure flow of becoming. Either the infinite field of virtuality is an immaterial effect of interacting bodies, or the bodies themselves emerge, actualize themselves, from this field of virtuality. In the logic of sense, Deleuze himself develops this opposition in the guise of two possible modes of the genesis of reality. The formal genesis, the emergence of reality out of the immanence of impersonal consciousness as the pure flow of becoming, is supplemented by the real genesis, the latter accounting for the emergence of the immaterial event surface itself out of bodily interaction. Is this opposition of the virtual as the site of productive becoming, and the virtual as the site of the sterile sense event not, at the same time, the opposition of the body without organs, BWO, and organs without a body, OWAB? Is, on the one hand, the productive flux of pure becoming not the BWO, the body not yet structured or determined as functional organs? And, on the other hand, are the OWAB not the virtuality of the pure affect extracted from its embeddedness in a body, like the smile in Alice in Wonderland that persists alone, even when the Cheshire Cat's body is no longer present? All right, said the cat, and this time it vanished quite slowly, beginning with the end of the tail and ending with the grin, which remained some time after the rest of it had gone. Well, I've often seen a cat without a grin, thought Alice, but a grin without a cat, it's the most curious thing I ever saw in my life. This notion of extracted OWAB reemerges forcefully in the time image, in the guise of the gaze itself as such an autonomous organ no longer attached to a body. These two logics, event is the power which generates reality, event is the sterile, pure effect of bodily interactions, also involve two privileged psychological stances. The generative event of becoming relies on the productive force of the schizo, this explosion of the unified subject in the impersonal multitude of desiring intensities, intensities that are subsequently constrained by the Oedipal matrix. The event as sterile, immaterial effect, relies on the figure of the masochist who finds satisfaction in the tedious repetitive game of staged rituals, whose function is to postpone forever the sexual passage à l'acte. Can one effectively imagine a stronger contrast than that of the schizo throwing himself without any reservation into the flux of multiple passions? and of the masochist clinging to the theatre of shadows in which his meticulously staged performances repeat again and again the same sterile gesture. 
So what if we conceive Deleuze's opposition of the intermixing of material bodies and the immaterial effect of sense along the lines of the Marxist opposition of base and superstructure? Is not the flow of becoming the superstructure par excellence, the sterile theatre of shadows ontologically cut off from the site of material production, and precisely as such the only possible space of the event? The tension between Deleuze's two ontologies clearly translates into two different political logics and practices. The ontology of productive becoming clearly leads to the leftist topic of the self-organization of the multitude of molecular groups, which resist and undermine the molar totalizing systems of power. The old notion of the spontaneous, non-hierarchical, living multitude opposing the oppressive, reified system, the exemplary case of leftist radicalism linked to philosophical idealist subjectivism. The problem is that this is the only model of the politicization of Deleuze's thought available. The other ontology, that of the sterility of the sense event, appears apolitical. However, what if this other ontology also involves a political logic and practice of its own, of which Deleuze himself was unaware? Should we not then proceed like Lenin in 1915, when, in order to ground a new revolutionary practice, he returned to Hegel, not to his directly political writings, but primarily to his logic. What if, in the same way, there is another Deleuzean politics to be discovered here? The first hint in this direction may be provided by the already mentioned parallel between the couple, corporeal causes, immaterial flow of becoming, and the old Marxist couple, base superstructure. Such a politics would take into account both the irreducible duality of objective, material, socio-economic processes taking place in reality, as well as the explosion of revolutionary events, of the political logic proper. What if the domain of politics is inherently sterile, the domain of pseudo-causes, a shadow theatre, but nonetheless crucial in transforming reality? What this means is that one should accept the gap between sterile virtual movements and the actuality of power. This solution is more paradoxical than it may appear. One should bear in mind that virtuality stands for expressive productivity, while actual state power operates at the level of representation. Productivity is real, the state is representative. This is the way to break out of the philosophical paradigm of productivity versus the positive order of being, the true gap is not that between reality and its representation. Reality and representation are not opposed, but on the same side. They form the same order of positive being. Productivity is thus not the metaphysical principle or source of reality to be opposed to the mere appearance of substantial being. Substantial being is all there really is, while the causality of productivity is a pseudo-causality, since productivity operates in a sterile, shadowy, virtual domain. Is this duality not prefigured in the Heideggerian struggle between world and earth, which we encounter today in the antinomy that defines our experience? On the one hand, there is the fluidification, volatilization of our experience. It's desubstantialization. This exponentially exploding lightness of being culminates in the cyber dream of the transformation of our very identity as a human being from hardware to software, to a program able to be reloaded from one to another hardware. Reality is here virtualized. Any failure can be undone by rewinding and having another try at it. However, this virtualized world in which we dwell is threatened by the shadow of what we usually designate as the prospect of ecological catastrophe, the imponderable heaviness and complexity, the inertia of Earth catching up, reminding us of the fragile equilibrium which forms the invisible background foundation of our survival on Earth, and which we can destroy, and thus destroy ourselves, through global warming, through new viruses, through a gigantic asteroid hitting the Earth. Never in the history of humanity was the tension so palpable between the unbearable lightness of our being the media providing us with the strangest sensations with the click, cutting through the resistance of reality, promising a frictionless world, and the unpredictable background of the earth. At the political level proper, is not Negri himself on the tracks of the solution of asserting the irreducible gap when he proposes the formula of governance as the tension dialogue between state power and the self-organized multitudes movements?
Ma was well aware of this duality, which is why he intervened at the climax of the Cultural Revolution, when the Shanghai Commune attempted to get rid of the party state apparatus itself and replace it with communal self-organization. Such an organization, he warned, is too weak when it comes to suppressing counter-revolution. When it comes to this threat, one needs pure and raw power. Of all important things, the possession of power is the most important. Such being the case, the revolutionary masses, with a deep hatred for the class enemy, make up their minds to unite, form a great alliance, and seize power. Seize power! Seize power! All the party power, political power, and financial power usurped by the counter-revolutionary revisionists and those diehards who persistently cling to the bourgeois reactionary line must be recaptured. This intervention by Mao is usually quoted as the proof of his ruthless manipulation of the Red Guards. He only needed them to crush his opponents within the party nomenclatura, so that the moment this job was done and the Guardists persisted, wanting to dissolve the party state apparatus and effectively take it over, he instructed the army, the only stable state apparatus still functioning, to intervene, crushing the Red Guards' resistance and sending millions of the Guardists to the countryside to re-educate them. What if, however, such a reading is all too simple and misses the point? What if Mao was aware that the very flourishing of movements of the multitude always already had to rely on some dispositif of power which structures and sustains the very space within which they operate? Today, the movements for gay rights, human rights, and so on all rely on state apparatuses, which are not only the addressee of their demands, but also provide the framework for their activity stable civil life. The more fundamental reproach to Mao is the standard one of the postmodern left to traditional Leninist Marxists, that they all focus on state power, on taking over state power. However, the various successes in taking state power miserably failed in their goals, so the left should adopt a different, apparently more modest, but in fact much more radical strategy to withdraw from state power and focus on directly transforming the very texture of social life, everyday practices which sustain the entire social structure. This position was given its most elaborated form by John Holloway, change the world without taking power. The continually contested separation of doing, human activity, living labor, and the done, dead labor, capital, means that relations between people are reduced to relations between things. The social flow of doing, what Holloway terms human power to, is broken by power over. Our everyday existence is a series of struggles, hidden and open, violent and suppressed, conscious and unconscious. We are not a sleeping beauty, a humanity frozen in our alienation until our prince party comes to kiss us. We live rather in constant struggle to free ourselves from the curse. Any radical social change must therefore be anti-fetishistic in its approach, but the very opposite of fetishism is precisely the dark void which cannot be seen or plotted, the path we make by treading, the questions we ask in asking itself. There is a moment of truth in this approach. This truth is the truth first given its classic formulation by La Boétie in his Treatise on Voluntary Servitude. Our passive endurement of power constitutes it. We do not obey and fear power because it is in itself so powerful. On the contrary, power appears powerful because we treat it as such. This fact opens up the space for a magical passive revolution which, instead of directly confronting power, gradually undermines it through the subterranean digging of the mole, through abstaining from participation in the everyday rituals and practices that sustain it. In a way, was Mahatma Gandhi not doing exactly this when he led the anti-British resistance in India? Instead of directly attacking the colonial state, he organized movements of civil disobedience, of boycotting British products, of creating a social space outside the scope of the colonial state. Another field of such undermining of the rule of capital is consumer self-organization. On this view, one should drop the traditional leftist privileging of production as the only substantial reality of social life. The position of the worker-producer and that of consumer should be sustained as irreducible in their divergence, without privileging one as the deeper truth of the other. 
value is created in the production process. However, it is, as it were, created there only potentially, since it is only actualized as value when the produced commodity is sold and the circle MCM is thus completed. Crucial in this temporal gap between the production of value and its actualization, even if value is produced in production, without the successful completion of the process of circulation, there is, stricto sensu, no value. The temporality is here that of the futur and tirieur. In other words, value is not immediately. It only will have been. It is retroactively actualized, performatively enacted. In production, value is generated in itself, while only through the completed circulation process does it become for itself. This is how Kojin Karatani resolves the Kantian antinomy of value, which is and is not generated in the process of production. It is generated there only in itself, and it is because of this gap between in and for itself that capitalism needs formal democracy and equality. What precisely distinguishes capital from the master-slave relation is that the worker confronts him as consumer and possessor of exchange values, and that in the form of the possessor of money, in the form of money, he becomes a simple centre of circulation, one of its infinitely many centres, in which his specificity as worker is extinguished. What this means is that, in order to complete the circle of its reproduction, capital has to pass through this critical point at which the roles are inverted. Surplus value is realised in principle only by workers in totality buying back what they produce. This point is crucial for Karatani. It provides the key leverage from which to oppose the rule of capital today. Is it not natural that the proletarian should focus their attack on that unique point at which they approach capital from the position of a buyer? and consequently at which it is capital which is forced to court them. If workers can become subjects at all, it is only as consumers. Today, this key role of consumption has reasserted itself in an unexpected way, referring to Georges Bataille's notion of the general economy of sovereign expenditure, which he opposes to the restrained economy of capitalism's endless profiteering, the German post-humanist philosopher Peter Sloterdijk provides the outlines of capitalism split from itself, its imminent self-overcoming. Capitalism culminates when it creates out of itself its own most radical and the only fruitful opposite, totally different from what the classical left, caught in its miserabilism, was able to dream about. His positive mention of Andrew Carnegie shows the way, the sovereign self-negating gesture of the endless accumulation of wealth is to spend this wealth on things beyond price and outside market circulation, the public good, the arts and sciences, health and so on. This concluding sovereign gesture enables the capitalist to break out of the vicious cycle of endless expanded reproduction, of gaining money in order to earn more money. When he donates his accumulated wealth to the public good, the capitalist self-negates himself as the mere personification of capital and its reproductive circulation. His life acquires meaning. It is no longer just expanded reproduction as an autotelic goal. Furthermore, the capitalist thus accomplishes the shift from eros to thymos, from the perceived erotic logic of accumulation to public recognition and reputation. What this amounts to is nothing less than elevating figures such as Soros or Gates to personifications of the inherent self-negation of the capitalist process itself. Their work of charity, their immense donations to public welfare, is not just a personal idiosyncrasy. Whether sincere or hypocritical, it is the logical concluding point of capitalist circulation necessary from the strictly economic standpoint, since it allows the capitalist system to postpone its crisis. It re-establishes balance, a kind of redistribution of wealth to the truly needy, without falling into a fatal trap. The destructive logic of resentment and enforced status redistribution of wealth, which can only end in generalized misery. It also avoids, one might add, the other mode of re-establishing a kind of balance and asserting thymos through sovereign expenditure, namely wars. This paradox signals a sad predicament of ours. Contemporary capitalism cannot reproduce itself on its own. It needs extra-economic charity 
to sustain the cycle of social reproduction. Governance and Movements Every revolution thus consists of two different aspects, factual revolution plus spiritual reform, namely actual struggle for the state power plus the virtual struggle for the transformation of customs, of the substance of everyday life, what Hegel called the silent weaving of the spirit, which undermines the invisible foundations of power, so that the formal change is the final act of taking note of what has already taken place. For one has only to remind the dead form that it is dead, and it disintegrates. In his Phenomenology, again, Hegel quotes the famous passage from Diderot's nephew of Rameau about the silent, ceaseless weaving of the spirit in the simple inwardness of its substance. It infiltrates the noble parts through and through, and soon has taken complete possession of all the vitals and members of the unconscious idol. Then, one fine morning, it gives its comrade a shove with the elbow. A bang, crash, the idol lies on the floor. On one fine morning, whose noon is bloodless if the infection has penetrated to every organ of spiritual life. This, however, is not Hegel's final word. He goes on to point out that this spirit concealing its action from itself is only one side of the realization of pure insight. At the same time, being a conscious act, this spirit must give its moments a definite manifest existence and must appear on the scene as a sheer uproar and a violent struggle with its antithesis. In the transition to the new, there is a passionate struggle going on, which is over once the opposing force notices how its very opposition is already impregnated with the opponent's logic. This, then, is how we are to read the two apparently opposed features, the priority of the form, the silent weaving of the spirit, together. The latter does not concern content, but the form itself. Again, in the case of a televangelist preacher, this silent weaving undermines his message at the level of its own form. The way he delivers the message subverts its content. The lesson of failures such as the Cultural Revolution is that the focus should be shifted from the utopian goal of the full reign of productive expressivity that no longer needs representation, state order, capital, and so forth, to the question, what kind of representation should replace the existing liberal democratic representative state? Is Negri's proposal of a citizen's income not an indication in this sense? It is an institutional representative measure, not for homini sacer, for full citizens. It implies state representation. It is not linked to an individual's productivity, but is the representative condition and framework for opening up the possible space of expressive productivity. Negri characterizes the contemporary situation as one of permanent governance. Power is broken into two. In order to be realized, it no longer has the possibility of determining a norm, then executing it subsequently in a concrete administrative act. The norm can't be realized without consensus, which has to be seen as the participation of subjects. Incidentally, this notion of dual power, of governance as the interaction between representative state power and councils of expressive movements, has a long tradition on the left. Among others, it was advocated by Karl Kautsky in 1918 to 19, when he rejected the exclusive alternative, either the National Assembly or the Council Assembly, seeking their integration, with each of them fulfilling different and specific tasks. The councils, Kautsky argued, ought not to be chosen as the sole form of electoral representation, even if they enjoyed the support of the majority of the population, for they were deficient both technically and politically. To opt exclusively for the council form would be to introduce a system based on workplace and occupation that would exact particularist and corporatist tendencies. In parliamentary elections to a national assembly, on the other hand, social interests were homogenized and great political parties came to the fore. Trotsky, the target of Kautsky's critique, 
advocates the same duality when he makes a plea for the interplay between class self-organization and political leadership of the revolutionary vanguard party. The main form of direct democracy of the expressive multitude in the 20th century was so-called councils, Soviets. Almost everybody in the West loved them, including liberals such as Hannah Arendt, who perceived in them the echo of the ancient Greek life of the polis. Throughout the epoch of really existing socialism, the secret hope of democratic socialists was the direct democracy of the Soviets, the local councils as the form of self-organization of the people, and it is deeply symptomatic how, with the decline of really existing socialism, this emancipatory shadow which haunted it all the time has also disappeared. Is this not the ultimate confirmation of the fact that the conciliar model of democratic socialism was just a spectral double of bureaucratic, really existing socialism, its inherent transgression with no substantial positive content of its own, that is, unable to serve as the permanent basic organizing principle of a society. What both really existing socialism and conciliar democracy shared was the belief in the possibility of a self-transparent organization of society, which would preclude political alienation. State apparatuses, institutionalized rules of political life, legal order, the police, and so on. And is the basic experience of the end of really existing socialism not precisely the rejection of this shared feature, the resigned postmodern acceptance of the fact that society is a complex network of subsystems, which is why a certain level of alienation is constitutive of social life, so that a totally self-transparent society is a utopia with totalitarian potential. No wonder then that the same holds for today's practices of direct democracy, from the favelas to post-industrial digital culture. Do the descriptions of the new tribal communities of computer hackers not often evoke the logic of conciliar democracy? They all have to rely on a state apparatus, that is, for structural reasons. They cannot take over the entire field. Negri's motto, no governing without movements, should therefore be countered with no movements without governing without a state power sustaining the space for movements. Negri dismisses the representative democratic system. The parliamentary system of representation has gone bad. You can't do anything there. We need to invent new things. However, insofar as expressive movements have to rely on a presupposed ground, one can defend democracy, not the direct form, but precisely the representative form, as providing the necessary ground for the movement's exercise of expressive freedom, its abstract universal formal character, one person, one vote, and so on, is the only appropriate one for providing such a neutral ground. It is the tension between representative democracy and the movement's direct expression that allows us to formulate the difference between an ordinary democratic political party and the stronger, uppercase, party, as in Communist Party. An ordinary political party fully assumes the representative function. Its entire legitimization is provided by elections, while the party considers the formal procedure of democratic elections secondary as regards the real political dynamics of movements expressing their force. This, of course, does not mean that the party looks for its legitimization in movements which are external to it. The party rather perceives, posits itself, as the movement's Selbstaufhebung, self-sublation. It does not negotiate with movements. It is not a movement transubstantiated into the form of political universality, ready to assume full state power, and which, as such, ne s'autorise que de lui-même. Where democracy is not enough is with regard to what Badieu called the constitutive excess of representation over the represented. At the level of the law, state power only represents the interests, and so on, of its subjects. It serves them. It is responsible to them and is itself subjected to their control. However, at the level of the superego underside, the public message of responsibility and the rest is supplemented by the obscene message of unconditional exercise of power. Laws do not really bind me. I can do to you whatever I want. I can treat you as guilty if I decide so. I can destroy you if I say so. This obscene excess is a necessary constituent of the notion of sovereignty, whose signifier is the master signifier. The asymmetry is here structural. 
That is, the law can only sustain its authority if subjects hear in it the echo of the obscene, unconditional self-assertion. Democracy presupposes a minimum of alienation. Those who exert power can only be held responsible to the people if there is a minimal distance of representation between them and the people. In totalitarianism, this distance is cancelled. The leader is supposed to directly present the will of the people, and the result is, of course, that the empirical people are even more radically alienated in their leader. He directly is what they really are, their true identity, their true wishes and interests, as opposed to their confused empirical wishes and interests. In contrast to the authoritarian power alienated from its subjects, the people, here the empirical people, are alienated from themselves. This, of course, in no way implies a simple plea for democracy and rejection of totalitarianism. There is, on the contrary, a moment of truth in totalitarianism. Hegel had already pointed out how political representation does not mean that people already know in advance what they want and then charge their representatives with advocating their interests. They only know them in themselves. It is their representative who formulates their interests and goals for them, making them for themselves. The totalitarian logic thus makes explicit, posits as such, a split which always already cuts from within the represented people. One should not be afraid here to draw the radical conclusion concerning the figure of the leader. Democracy as a rule cannot reach beyond pragmatic utilitarian inertia. It cannot suspend the logic of the servicing of goods, service des biens, Consequently, in the same way that there is no self-analysis, since the analytic change can only occur through the transferential relationship onto the external figure of the analyst, a leader is necessary to trigger the enthusiasm for a cause, to bring about the radical change in the subjective position of his followers, to transubstantiate their identity. What this means is that the ultimate question of power is not, is it democratically legitimized or not, but... What is the specific character, the social content, of the totalitarian excess that pertains to sovereign power as such, independently of its democratic or non-democratic character? It is at this level that the concept of the dictatorship of the proletariat functions. In it, the totalitarian excess of power is on the side of the part of no part, not on the side of the hierarchical social order. To put it bluntly, ultimately, the people are in power in the full sovereign sense of the term. In other words, it is not only that their representatives temporarily occupy the empty place of power, but much more radically, they twist the very space of state representation in their direction. One could argue that Chavez and Morales are coming close to what could be the contemporary form of the dictatorship of the proletariat, although interacting with many agents and movements drawing on their support, their governments obviously have privileged links with the dispossessed of the favelas. Chavez is ultimately their president. They are the hegemonic force behind his rule. And although Chavez still respects the democratic electoral process, it is clear that his fundamental commitment and source of legitimization is not there, but in the privileged relationship with the poor. This is the dictatorship of the proletariat in the form of democracy. A convincing story can be told about the hypocrisy of the Western left, which to a large extent ignores the striking liberal renaissance that is going on in Iran's civil society. Since the Western intellectual references of this renaissance of figures such as Habermas, Arendt and Rorty, even Giddens, not the usual gang of anti-imperialist radicals, the left makes no fuss when leading figures of this movement lose their jobs and are arrested, and so on. With their advocacy of the boring topics of the division of powers, of democratic legitimization, of the legal defense of human rights, and so forth, they are viewed with suspicion. They do not appear as sufficiently anti-imperialist and anti-American. However, one should nonetheless raise the more fundamental question. Is bringing Western liberal democracy the real solution for getting rid of the religious fundamentalist regimes? Or are these regimes rather a symptom of liberal democracy itself? 
what to do in cases like those of Algeria or the Palestinian territories, where a free democratic election brings fundamentalists to power. When Rosa Luxemburg wrote that dictatorship consists in the way in which democracy is used and not in its abolition, her point was not that democracy is an empty framework which can be used by different political agents. Hitler also came to power through, more or less, free democratic elections, but that there is a class bias inscribed into this very empty procedural frame. This is why, when radical leftists come to power through elections, their signe de reconnaissance is that they move to change the rules, to transform not only the electoral and other state mechanisms, but also the entire logic of the political space, relying directly on the power of mobilized movements, imposing different forms of local self-organization, and so on. In short, to guarantee the hegemony of their base, they are in order guided by a correct intuition regarding the class bias of the democratic form.